Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, today we are still within the feast of the Nativity of the Mother of God. The life of the Mother of God is a framework within which our salvation takes place. Our salvation is through Christ, and Christ became man through the Mother of God. So all of the liturgical commemorations for all of the year, the big ones, are surrounding uh, his commemorations are the commemorations of the birth and the death of the Mother of God. We celebrated the mission in August, and we're beginning the liturgical round again with the nativity of the Mother of God. Without her participation, he wouldn't have come. Now, he had a ton of preparation involved. She had a ton of preparation given to her by God to her completely devout parents. They prayed forever for the coming of the Mother of God. The, her parents did. They were without children, and they'd been married a long time, and in the culture of the time, he was not, he was socially below par not to have children in the very public. So they didn't for a long time. That's why the, one of the hymns says, uh, Joachim and Anna were relieved from the reproach of childhood. And like the barren Hannah, Samuel's mother, Samuel, the mother, uh, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, promised that Samuel would be completely devoted to God, gave her over to service in the temple, and gave him over to be the culminating judge in the history of the judges of the people of the Old Testament, the Israelite people. And he ushered in the kingship. The mother of God, born of a barren woman, ushered in the kingship of the king of all creation. Our Lord brought our salvation as a result of her being born. Never forget that. And many people who call themselves Christians who would denigrate the role of the mother of God, denigrate the role of the most pure Theotokos. For the, those who are not familiar with that term, that means the birth giver to God. On all icons of the mother of God are two things. Mahia the mother of God, and Theotokos, or the birth giver to God, or in the uh, Slavonic rendering, Bogorodice. Both those names are on all icons of the Mother of God. It's not a proper icon of the Mother of God if it does not have both those things on it, because she has two offices. She's a mother, like every mother that ever lived, and that ever will live, and she was also the bringer about of God in the flesh. So that's why the two different words are on her icon. So we'll never forget of her connection to our salvation. And so we were still in that feast. It's one of the feasts that has an after feast of some time in incorporating this day. And it concludes tomorrow on the day before uh, the, the eve of the feast of the Holy Cross. So we see both the initiation and the climax of our salvation within the first month of commemoration of the liturgical year. We'll get to everything to do with the Holy Cross. It's plenty. But there's a reason that all the priests have this on the front of it. To remind us that that way that she laid the way for is the way of the cross. So, on that, 
The other commemoration for today is one of the great followers of the Way of the Cross, one of the greatest examples of penitence, of repentance that ever lived. I very much regret that we don't have an icon specifically of St. Theodora of Alexandria. She was married, but through blandishments of somebody who did not have her good at heart, she was deceived into being seduced into having an adulterous relationship. Once she realized what she had done, I mean, she knew what she had done while she was doing it, but once she had done it and realized the complete enormity, that word young brothers and sisters means the complete overwhelming badness of what she had done, she took herself away from this world in every possible way. She remained a woman through her life, but she disguised herself as a man and represented herself, because obviously she had a woman's voice and everything, represented herself as a human. That is, a, a male born without all of the proper accoutrements thereof, and who then goes through puberty. There are a number of examples like that. Anybody who's interested in American history, one of the primary, one of the primary early uh, uh, fathers of the country in the 1810s, 20s, and 30s was John Randolph. You can see his speeches. If you look through the history of the time, you can see his speeches all over the place. But he never went through puberty. And so, this squeaky voice dude takes over the House of Deputy. That's, that's a personality that's going on this. And likewise, as an emblem of repentance, the Venerable Theodora of Alexandria, Why? representing herself as Theodora, is an is an un a, a, a supreme example. Now, the only other example is the one where we that psalm we say every day, we're supposed to say every day with our prayers, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy. It was written by a holy king and prophet and ancestor of our Lord David after his adultery with Bathsheba. We went on through the, again, another example of how God can take something untoward and turn it into glory. Bathsheba married him after David had arranged for her husband to be killed. He was very bad. He did a very bad couple of things. And she became his wife, among others and became the mother of Solomon. That Solomon, who the Lord refers to when comparing him to the lilies of the field, even Solomon in all his glory could not be compared to the lilies of the field. Solomon, the son of Bathsheba, if you want to know how to pray, go to the kings of the Chronicles, either one, and look up Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the first temple. That, brothers and sisters, is way out of prayer. So that's an example of, as, it, as it's spoken of in the liturgy of St. Basil, that God can make good from that. So likewise, in the case of Theodora, after, the, after she had um, absented herself from her, her husband and from the world hid under, in the guise of a man in a monastery, in a men's monastery for her life and never ceased to pray. Many people are, are somewhat disturbed sometimes by their 
very penitential character of all of our services. We got nothing on this lady. She's the emblem of penitence. Through her life, she prayed like an example of prayer. And she even endured a subsequent thing where she was visiting some place and approached by a woman who wanted to have an adulterous relationship with her. She refused. So the woman went and uh, applied herself to a man and became pregnant and then blamed St. Theodora for called him the father of the baby. The saint, recognizing that this was an additional bearing, bore that way of the cross yet once again and took to herself the fatherhood, impossible, but took to herself the fatherhood of this young infant. She was cast, her abbot cast her out of the monastery, and so she lived in a separate place with the young fellow, young guy, young kid. Raised him up in an atmosphere of prayer. Raised him up to be one with God. As long as he was with her, he learned how to pray. She bore the fact of being his parent, even though she wasn't, because she recognized that God was giving her a gift of an additional opportunity to him. Just think about that. Think about how many times you wanted to repent. Right? How many people, oh boy, now's my chance to repent. Yeah, right. But she gave thanks to God and for the little boy. Eventually she was taken back into the monastery because the abbot realized that she was guiltless. And back into the monastery with the little boy. And raised him in that monastery to pray and be like the other, be like the monks. He was like Justinian's age, my, my five-year-old. I, mean, I think she, uh, I think he lived to be, he was eight when she became ill and uh, was on her deathbed. And so he prayed by her bed, he prayed with her, she prayed with him. And they were praying together, and she reposed. She died. She gave up her soul to God while praying with her supposed son. After she died, the standard thing when you have a reposed Orthodox person, a monastic, is you take their clothes off and wash their person. So the abbot took her clothes off and she was a woman. This left everybody beyond speechless, traumatized, you might say. A woman had lived as a man and had raised a child as his father. Now the church is replete with examples of the kind, full of people who have done things like this. What would one expect with the example of the cross of Christ and Christ himself? What, what else would one expect? The wall here, the walls here are full of people who have given themselves over to God in one way or the other. As I said, I only regret that I don't have an icon of her. 
But we have the icon of the life. We have the image given by the life that we can all read. I recommend, along with looking up Solomon's prayer of the dedication of the temple in uh, first, second, third, fourth kings, I think in the way. Just look in it, look in your concordance about Solomon's dedication to prayer. If you have a subject index in the Bible, everybody should have a Bible that has all the help you could get so you could refer in it without having to, let's see, page 1005. No, it's not there yet. So you're not just do that. Especially if you've got one of those Indian print, Indian paper things, you know, those little thin, thin page things. When I grew up as a Baptist, people brought their Bibles to church and read them. And he would announce the passage, and everybody turned to it. And you hear all over the church this rustling. And the pastor stopped everything and said, That's one of the sweetest sounds ever. It's a rustling of Bible things. What do you expect from that? I grew up a Baptist, I know what he was talking about. So, anyway, we have. The icon of the most holy Theotokos. I mean, she remains through these miraculous, wonder-working images of her that have persisted down to this time. The one there, the coarse icon, the oldest one, the rightmost of the three on the cross table there, is 700 plus years old. The, the, the icon is. And the Iran icon, the one on the leftmost, that is an image of a copy made by uh, at, at a monastery in, um, in on Mount Athos, and is reputed to have been an icon that made its way across the sea by itself. Don't forget these things. These are wonderful tales that we have. It made its way across the sea by itself and was taken to the uh, monastery by the monks who found it and put in the church. So the abbot went to the church the next day and said, where is it? And the icon was by the gate of the monastery. So they took it and put it back in the church. And then it wound up by the gate of the so, enough of this, the abbot built a church at the gate, around the icon. And so, the original icon is called the gatekeeper, or Tartitza, because she was going to protect the master herself. This is um, among the many things that God gives us, following uh, my father's favorite Bible verses, he shall give you life and you shall have it more abundantly. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It is just so that the Holy Church of God, the Holy Church of Christ, has bequeathed to us all of the animals, of the people that are in it, and of the things that are in it. As John the Baptist said, God could, of his own will, make children of Abraham out of these stones. And so we have seen how obvious God uses them. He uses people and things. He doesn't, he's not bound by our definition. God is not bound, period. So if we want to see unbounded work of God in ourselves, then we have to do something of an imitation of this lady here, St. Theodora. We have to give ourselves to God. He will make us abundant. Perhaps not in ways we all think of, like the 
St. Theodora was great, grateful to have a gift of another totally untrue accusation against her so that she could repent more. Our late beloved Metropolitan Laura, whose image is on the wall at the far end of the closet, uh, by the closet there, said, when you come to realize it, you come to realize that everything is a gift from God. Let us pray with that kind of perspicacity, that kind of vision that sees what happens, everything that happens as a gift from God. Starting with being together in this loving fellowship now. I'm so glad that we could be together with you. I pray that I pray that we can have this fellowship present or not. We can have this devotion to God whether we're in church or not. Church is a place it's like a feeding station. I mean services are like a feeding station. But you know, when you sit down to eat, you don't sit down to eat and then go play like you didn't have anything. So the church is a spiritual feeding station, enabling you to be fed for the journey. Which is coming to public, you know, continually. Even at my decrepit age, I feel the journey continuing. I feel it not stopping. It's a wonderful thing. It's beyond wonderful. I was recommending a film. Excuse me, people. I talked about movies too much. I was rec recommending a film to some people called The Straight Story. I don't know if I mentioned to this to all of you. Now I will. This old man. He's blind. Part, well, not completely, but his eyes are like mine. I can't see very much of the eye. And then he discovers, he hears that his brother, to whom he has not spoken in 10 years because they had a falling out. He hears that his brother has had a stroke. So he determines how, that he's going to go see him. He says to his daughter, Rose, darling, I've got to go back on the road. I've got to go see Lyle. His daughter, led by Sissy Spake, said, But, Dad, how are you? And I've not got that figure yet. And the way he figures it is, he takes his riding lawnmower and rides it from Central Iowa over to Wisconsin to see his brother. Now that's a true story, actually. It's embellished, of course, for the sake of cinematic life. But this guy actually did that. That's the kind of emotion we have to pick up. But if something needs to happen, we gotta we gotta go with God and let it happen through us if if we can. And we need to be grateful for these opportunities. Now, one can imagine driving down the road and seeing this poor old guy driving a lawnmower on the roadside. But he did. Now, his brother saw him out there, and he drove the lawnmower into his yard, and he finally realizes, the brother finally realizes, and says, Did you drive that thing all the way out here to see me? I did, Lyle. And after that, God loves us to speak. Let us resolve to help God help us to do something to where, like a revelation of St. Theodora as a woman on her deathbed, leaves people unable to talk. It's a wonder that has been created. We are part of the wonder anyway. We're part of God's wonder. Is we look at each other and we see light eyes and flesh and everything to do with being a human being. 
that in itself is beyond amazing. God be with us as we keep the feast, as we remember the great saint, and as we prepare to go on with our daily life as members of the body of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed of the Lord be upon you, with grace and love for mankind, always now and ever and unto the age of the